Thank you so much, Justin and Yona. With that, I would like to invite, because the next one is, uh, I'll keep the slide on the agenda one. Just give me one second. I would like to start uh, with the panel discussion, and I would like to invite here very experienced some of the mentors and mentees from Fedora on stage, please. I would like to invite Adam Williamson, Kevin Frenzy, Mo Duffy, Jess, and Sumantro. So there are two ways to do it. Uh, either I introduce all of them, or they can introduce themselves. So I will give this that opportunity, which reminds me, I did not introduce myself, and that is what happened after game night and <laughs> the goof up with the slides. So I am Amita Sharma, uh, and I'm from Pune, India. It has been 12 years in Red Hat, and uh, for my day job, I am a manager. Uh, who manages a very diverse team uh, at Red Hat for Rhodes Project, which is data science, QE. And um, out of my interest, I contribute to Fedora DEI team and also for the Mentorship Summit now. Um, with that, I would like to pass it on to Adam. Hi, uh, I'm Adam Williamson. I am the Fedora QA team lead at Red Hat. I've been at Red Hat for 14 years, been involved in the open source community for oh, over 20, I guess. Um, so yeah, I work on Fedora QA most of the time, and I don't have as much mentoring experience as some of the other people on this panel, but I will try and ask useful questions. So <laughs> yeah, Kevin? Uh, hi, I'm Kevin Finzi. Uh, I do Fedora infrastructure and release engineering, and uh, I've been involved in open source for a really, really long time. I'm really old, but you know, don't hold it against me. Um, and I will echo the sentiments there. I, I think there's a lot of experience on this panel, uh, which uh, hopefully we can uh, learn some things from. But you know, the open source community is just always, and Fedora specifically, has always been very uh, uh, open and uh, mentor-driven and learning-driven and open, and uh, I, I hope we can learn a lot. So. Mo. Hi, I'm Mo. I'm a UX designer at Red Hat. I first started using Fedora with FC3. Started at Red Hat in May 2004 as an intern. I drove and I said, hey, I'll work for free for the summer. <laughs> so just so you see my level of sanity. Um, <laughs> um, I have mentored many people um, over the course of my tenure in um, the Fedora community. And um, one of them is sitting right next to me. So I'm going to hand it over to her, Jess. So, hi, I'm Jess. Um, I was interning at Red Hat for a year and a half as a Fedora um, designer, and uh, I'm now back volunteering on the Fedora design team. But, uh, yeah, my mentor was, was Mo, and still is a great mentor. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so I'll, I, I suppose um, uh, I can say my piece about how the, how the mentorship went and stuff. So, yeah, I'll hand it over to Samantha. Hi, I'm Shmantro. I work for the Fedora QA team. Adam is my mentor. He, st he started mentoring me for QA for a long time. Uh, I joined Red Hat in 2016. Before that, I used to work for, rather volunteer for Mozilla and Wikipedia. So I have my open source days goes back uh, pre-Firefox OS days. Um, and then um, once I joined uh, Fedora, I was like completely working for the QA team, made my way into Council and Mindshare and worked with community thereafter. So that's, that's mostly about me. So uh, I would just like to say that uh, we have very brilliant and experienced Fedora contributors here. 
Our goal here is that everybody can be mentor, and uh, you see that some of them are mentors here, the experienced mentees here. We will be with them for next one hour, and I don't want it to be just us on stage talking. It should be an interactive session. So if, if anybody would like to contribute as well, you can raise your hand and talk and ask questions and contribute, okay? So the first topic which we I would like to, it, it's very obvious and um, maybe sound cliche though, but what is, why do you think the mentorship is important in any of the open source community, not just Fedora? I, I can take it. Um, this is just one specific example, maybe not the most important or the only. But I recently had a conversation with somebody who I really look up to, um, Dan Walsh, if anybody knows him. And um, he's actually getting close to retirement. So for him, um, the mentorship that he gives to the people at Red Hat and in the community is important because he, he would like to stop <laughs> at some point. And <laughs> so I think that sort of if you think of um, succession, it's not just, you know, we're not all close to retirement, but um, being able to go on vacation, <laughs> being able to um, step away when you need to, I, I think it's important, but you can't do that if you don't lift others up around you so that they have an opportunity to step in. I would also like to know Mente's point of view, one of the Mente's, if you would like to contribute to that. Why do you think it is important? Uh, well, I suppose when I uh, started off in uh, Red Hat last year, like contributing to Fedora, uh, it was my first time knowing anything about open source, so I feel like having a mentor is very important to kind of find your footing on, like, you know, what is this about? Like, yeah, and, um, yeah, I suppose just, um, yeah, I, I, I said my piece. <laughs> so do you think that, uh, this is the relative uh, continuous question to that discussion, do you think without an official mentor, it would be easier for you to onboard? Because in open source communities, we all are helpful. We all are there. But hel um, holding somebody accountable for the full-time mentorship, who will, uh, has that made any difference, any sort of difference? So, so uh, I can kind of address this. In the infrastructure project, we kind of uh, and I think a lot of open source projects, we kind of treat mentoring or basically as like the group is mentoring every person that's coming in so that they know it's safe to ask questions and so forth. But that said, having a specific person that you can ask questions of and know uh, that that person will answer you or that person has, will set aside time for you is actually really important. So I think both sides of it are important. You have to have the community you know, if you ask a question, you know it's safe to ask a question, you know that somebody, whoever is available, will answer you. That's great, and it's also important to have somebody you can, like, talk to privately and say, I don't know what's going on here, can you help me out? Sure. Anybody from the audience would like to contribute to this? Do you think mentorship is important, a dedicated mentor in the community when you join that community? <laughs> Want me to go first? Okay. So I have run mentoring programs in OpenStack and other communities. And one of the reasons why it's important to have known mentors, even if they're not totally active, but at least a list, is when someone comes and they have a specific question and helps those who are running the programs know who to put them in touch with. Because one of the worst things is, is I contacted so-and-so and I never heard back. Yeah. yeah. And you lose them because you lost that connection. That, so that's a really important part of having known mentors. We have over the years tried one-on-one -on -one mentoring, um, kind of switched to the Kubernetes model of the cohorts, um, because that's easier on the mentors. We found out we couldn't get the mentees to even introduce themselves. So finding out what works best as methodology for your community is also important, and that also helps you know how many mentors you need to have, where you need to have them. 
Um, one of the reasons why I think that mentorship is like, important, um, well, I, I have had this personal experience where uh, I used to have this perspective from, uh, well, from a very experienced point, and then I stopped thinking from the perspective of someone who is really new to a certain technological stack, and I'm like, hmm, how would I explain it to them in a way it's really accessible? And mentoring someone allowed me to do just that, it also got me down to the basics so that I'm not able to uh, well, work on the things that I work on, but probably go back, back to the basics and explore more things because, well, it's both rewarding to the mentees that you're mentoring as well as to yourself because you're also learning something new with that. Very good point. Thank you so much. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, as somebody newer to the community, I've been appreciative of somebody who I would consider my mentor, um, who's Justin back there, as I have come in very unsure how to do things or how open source works. I've spent most of my career in corporate and coming into open source, it's a different ethos, right? And you look into kind of the, 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 the everything of Fedora and it's, it's intimidating and you don't know who to ask and you don't know like how are these processes and you know there's information overload and how, how do you do something, right? Um, and so I've been appreciative of having you know somebody who's been able to open a door to then help me talk to others and be able to communicate and I feel like I've been successful because of having a relationship uh, to be able to talk to somebody, right? Somebody I can communicate with. So as somebody who's a mentee, maybe not officially, but more in that sense, I've been appreciative of that kind of ethos that exists here for it. Well, those were all great inputs. I would just add one thing in there. As you said, it doesn't have to be formal always. Because sometimes, uh, okay, the newcomer comes in, they need a allocated full-time mentor. But sometimes we also, because of the personal life and everything, we need a, we take a break from the community. And even few days of a break, you come back, everything which used to be in the community from IRC to PGR to whatnot, all of that has been changed. And you are overwhelmed with the, those changes. And then you need somebody to bring you back and on board to all of these new things. So with that, we will move on to the second uh, topic, which is effective mentorship strategies. Uh, we know that we provide some tools here that, okay, you need to have goals, you need to have a time frame, you need to have an agenda, where uh, after six months or three months time, where the mentee look or stand after having this mentorship and all of that. What else? as organizers or as mentors, we can do more in our community to make this process more smoother and strategic and fruitful. What are your thoughts? I can start with that. So um, one of those things is we, as mentors, need to realize that every mentee among us actually has a different learning curve. And it goes with the saying that if we try to fit everybody on the same model that might not work for all the mentees. It might work for, it has actually worked pretty well for about 75% of my mentees, but the rest 25% are still those people I would want to have extra attention in order to retain them mostly. Because onboarding a mentee is one of the accountability that we have as mentors, but we also have to ensure they kind of keep still, uh, they, they keep being motivated the entire time while they are in the journey. So it, it should not feel to them as if like the mentor is forcing them to do things. It, they should feel motivated and that's one of the reasons why mentorship strategy is very important and becomes very handy. So that's, that's something that I keep in mind. I, I want to always have a perspective where I ask my mentees, what, do you feel what you're doing is right? Do you feel this is, uh, you, you, do you feel comfortable with? things? Do you want to change the way we do things? So that, that's, that constant feedback loop helps me understand their perspectives and how they are coming from. So I'd like to add, um, when, I, when I look at mentorships, I basically see them falling into two buckets, which I think we've already kind of brought up. Um, there's the kind of formalized kind, 
I view outreachy as one of those, and I have the privilege of working at Red Hat, so also Red Hat's formal intern program is a way. And for me as a mentor, the formal programs are helpful in that they have a very defined time scope. They have typically, not always, typically a pretty well-defined um, project. Some, sometimes that gets thrown to the wind and then you have to come up with something and that's fine too. Um, and the outreachy program has so many amazing um, regular weekly uh, learnings that apply to all interns, just about basic career and stuff like the things you can do. Um, and because it's managed, not, I don't have to do that, it's managed for the group of interns and they can ask questions as a group together and they're all having that same experience. I think that makes it a better experience for them than me trying to do that one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and the other thing about that outreachy in particular is there is a paycheck. <laughs> because um, the other type of mentorships that I would want to mention is just those informal, out of band, sometimes didn't quite plan it, but it worked really well and people gel together. And those are pretty magical, but they also don't have those limits. Um, and on both sides, like if, if the mentee is not getting paid, then they're, depending on their life circumstances and whatnot, um, they might not be coming in as regularly spending as many hours. So those internships tend to be more of like a slow burn, um, whereas the more formalized ones are very intense for a shorter period of time. And I think that, I have two things and I'll shut up. Um, the first thing is I think, I wonder if there is a middle ground that we could look at, um, some sort of not quite so intense and maybe not quite so slow and drawn out. Something in the middle, maybe that could be a good, but I, I don't, I've never seen that, so maybe it, it wouldn't work. Um, the other thing that I think that we could do is think about um, with the less formal ones is there just some little bit of structure like I don't like signing up for things because I'm usually too busy to do a good job at it um, but if there was some sort of um, just a little bit more structure like maybe a little bit of self-service type things and then um, on the mentor side I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that. But anyway, some thoughts. I see no, Adam's. I, I, I really like that idea because I was going to say something along those same lines. Um, all of the mentoring I've been involved with has been very much of the informal type, I would say. Is that fair to say, Samantha? Because I'm honored that you consider me your mentor, but we never sat down and yeah. set up a, a program. And I can say Kevin has definitely mentored me in a lot of things, but again, we never. And as Mo said, part of the reason for that is it's on me because whenever these things come up, I feel kind of intimidated by the structure and the scale and the, okay, if I sign up for this, is it going to eat my life for six months aspect mm -hmm. of it? But at the same time, doing the unstructured thing, it, it feels a little like you're feeling your way through a fog at times. So I think that's a really good idea and I don't have any better ideas for how it could work, but I like the, the way you're thinking. To that, do you think there can be some structure in place to balance that out, where some of them can be best practices and some of them are the important ones to be followed to strike that balance. Um, yeah, possibly. It, I like the idea of this as, this as well, but um, I think one other dimension to this is that there's, also, there's technical mentorships and more of a like social career men mentorship and those are very different buckets that I've had. I've had mentees that, you know, they're just wanting to learn how to do things and function in the community and, and get things done and, and so forth, they're contributing. But also people who are like on a more personal level, you know, how do I advance my career? Or how, you know, I'm having trouble with this manager or you know, things like that. And so it, it's, there's so much of this that's tailored to the particular relationship between the mentor and mentee. But I agree that it would be nice for, for the open source community to have a little bit more formality uh, around it. And maybe that's something like the join SIG could be involved in, like, you know, the join SIG could check in with somebody a certain amount of time after they're doing some kind of informal mentorship. But, you know, that's making it more formal. So I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Those were really uh, great inputs. Anybody from the audience. Amita just has something. Yeah. Okay. Just please go ahead. Oh, and then we no. I, 
<laughs> no, I, I was just going to say that I suppose going through my experience going through like a formal um, organization, like I know myself and Mo, when I like during the summer, we created like a 12 week plan and it was like formal, but like a relaxed formal. So like, <laughs> so like, say for example, if I was, just wasn't feeling something, I'd put it like to the next week. Um, but I suppose like we had that structure, but also I, I come to Mo about something, be like, hey, I don't know how to do this with this thing I have on, at, on this week, can you help me? And she'd give me resources like, um, but, yeah, like I, I, I really like the structure because I suppose myself, I'm not a very organized person. So it was nice to have someone give me like, <laughs> like be organized. <laughs> so I suppose that's, yeah, so. Thank you. All right, just based on what the comments were previous to this, um, and this is my first flock, but it almost sounds like we could take a half an hour, an hour, and do speed mentoring, which is basically we set up a couple technical tables, career tables, community tables. And generally, if you have enough numbers of both, then like after like five, 10 minutes, think of it as speed dating. The mentor moves to the next table of mentees. But if you have more mentors, then you know you have multiple mentors at the table and no one changes. But it's a great way of getting some really quick mentoring from a lot of people um, generally it's done at like KubeCon, Open Info Summit, you know, the bigger conferences. But even so, you're bringing people from all over the world here who have different experiences. And it could be easily done. Thank you so much. Those were really, really helpful thoughts, I think. Um, so one of the things that I do, as well as one of our teammates, uh, Aurelian does, is um, he holds a stream every Friday on Twitch, hacking away with some stuff in Fedora infrastructure. Um, it's really one-sided in nature, but people can tune right in, you know, get to know what he's doing, and he explains things in a very lucid manner, and um, yeah, people get to enjoy it. Uh, I've started doing, doing that as well, because hacking away on stuff by yourself is boring, and... Um, <laughs> For Fedora badges, I have started getting James and a bunch of other folks on call, and that way I get to get opinions on it, right? And that way it's not just me mentoring people, but I get to know about them. So it's kind of cross-mentoring, if you will. Thank you. Sure. Oh, no. <laughs> so I have one question. When you say something slightly more formal, slightly more structured than this side and less than that side, are you thinking specific to Fedora or more generally? Because it feels to me that the, the, the thing you've sparked in my head, and I may be talking nonsense here because it literally just fired off in my brain in the last two minutes. There's a lot of people who go out and learn programming on the internet and just go and look at YouTube things and so on, so that's one thing. And then there's a lot of transferable stuff within open source about how you contribute to a community, how you navigate things, how you get things done. And it feels like there ought to be something we can build around a set of reusable content that is itself open that we can use as a structure for something in that middle ground. I would agree. Yeah, I think generally some of, especially the stuff that is not like, like Kevin was saying, there's very much a technical component and the more social career component. And I think in open source generally, a lot of the social career component stuff is not specific to the project. It might be in that it could be, you know, oh, this specific person in the community is a person to talk to, like the referral of specifics. But other than that, it's general content. So, um, and the thing is here at Flock, with the Ansible folks and the Fedora folks, like I went to Don's talk and he had that, um, he showed the Meetup Kicks Toolkit. And I was like, oh my gosh, I could use this for so many communities I'm a part of. And it's this kind of sharing, it's just happenstance. Like, oh, I happened to go to Don's talk and saw this, otherwise I might not have known. So I think that that is a brilliant idea, maybe different communities sharing their social career resources. Outreachy itself, I wanna mention, does have those sorts of resources too that they send out to um, mentees and they send out, um, they, they do regular, calls where all the mentees can come in and ask questions and they have a speaker and stuff like that. Um, so, but we could do more, I think. That would, it's a good idea. 
Thank you so much. Uh, that's a lot to consume, I think, on this <laughs> single topic. Just, yes, please. just real quick, just wanted to mention um, to take into account how somebody might arrive here. So um, Jess, Mo, myself, and probably many others arrived via more of an educational route and got a formal internship with Red Hat. Um, but a lot of people arrive, like on our Thursday IRC meetings, we do a first thing of if there's anybody new here, introduce yourself and welcome, and they might arrive um, by becoming interested in open source or their first Linux distribution or something like that. So that's maybe something else to take into account of you arrive this way, I have a background in that, I might be able to assist you or maybe not, I don't know. Um, I have a question for the panel. So obviously the Fedora project is a project that's been around for a long time and mentorship as we can see has been a, a part of that project for pretty much the entirety of its history in one way or another. Now I s feel like we could probably all agree that you know open source and people's involvement in it is always a changing landscape uh, and so I'm, I'm curious of your thoughts of how the needs for mentorship might have changed over, let's say, the last five to ten years. And should we, you know, thinking about the changing land, landscape economically, or, you know, I work in a university, I can tell you, students now face very different situations than they did, you know, ten years ago when I was uh, an undergraduate myself. So, yeah, well, what's changed? How do you think that's impacted the needs for mentorship? I can start off with that. So <clears throat> one thing that I see, uh, this is from a very Indian perspective uh, because I come from India. So essentially in Indian perspective, if I go back five years or even seven years, what has actually happened is there used to be a set of people who to contribute to project in their free time, as you call it. Now these guys who are like contributing from a university standpoint, they're more, mostly looking out for a job. So they want to be more oriented to a job level skill set. So if they want to contribute, let's say, uh, I'm coming from a very technical perspective. So someone wants to contribute to kernel, they would probably start looking at kernel newbies uh, program first. And then if they are comfortable a little bit with shell, they probably would test Fedora kernels and go on that route, right? So it, it has slightly become oriented towards how this can be career helpful. This is not now anymore a hobbyist kind of thing, at least in India. It might be different across, but that is one of those things that I have seen. Second, I have seen the approachability for mentees has actually drastically increased with the awareness in open source. It's, it's directly proportional. Previously, uh, there was not much people who were aware about contents inside open source and what people would be able to do with open source. But as Linux became more mainstream and kept being pushed, Kubernetes was like swept across the entire landscape for the last good five years people started realizing the potential in open source. As a result, they wanted to be contributors. And the, the join seg, the, the channels that we used to have for people to come in and uh, check in with us about new ways to get in, that actually changed. So the generation wise, it started off with IRC and today I actually have a Telegram chat or a Telegram group where a lot of people join in to just get updates. So what usually has happened is the format of communication has actually drastically changed and that is also because uh, IRC probably I cannot stay logged in forever just to see whoever has messaged and whatnot. And, but in Telegram that's actually a sync and that's easy to do. And it's on everybody's phone, so that's better way to communicate right now. So the, the communication channels changed, and definitely the job orientation made it easier and easier for people to actually hone these skill sets, bring it, make, make it their own, and make it bigger, yeah. I just want to kind of add on to what Samantha said, because I noticed that it was really interesting, because what happened on our team is I started out on the Fedora QA team as the QA community person. 
and my job became more technical over time, and Symantro essentially came in to sort of replace me as the community person. And it was so interesting that what I remember from my time as a community person was like IRC and mailing lists and so on, and then Symantro came in and he had this whole new generation attitude, and he was reaching out to the kids on all these fancy new <laughs> communication methods that I was not on. And you know the classic quote, the medium is the message, and that changes how things work because the styles of communication are completely different on those platforms. So I think that's a really interesting change that's happened. It's, it shows how important it is to pass the torch yeah, to the sure, next one. I was kind of stuck in a rut. I think the big change, and I, it might be a little outside the five to ten year scope, but I think the big change is video chat and the accessibility to video chat made a huge difference because you could connect with people on a more human level. This conference is the first time I've met Jess in 3D. <laughs> but I, it honestly, was very natural meeting her, and I think I've had situations where I had a remote intern, but it was IRC mailing lists, and sort of meet them in person was like, well, okay, <laughs> I didn't know you look like that. So like, we didn't even couldn't find each other for like a couple of days of a conference. But um, I think that that is a big thing. And the fact that I can just, it, over time too, it's become very free. I think COVID really opened that up because a lot of companies were like, oh, this sucks for everybody, we'll, we'll make the account free or whatever. But um, the fact you can share screen, it's actually easier to, to show somebody how to do something over screen share than if they're literally over your shoulder mm -hmm. because they can look at it closer, whereas two heads bonking in front of a laptop <laughs> is not great. So I, I think video chat has also changed how mm -hmm. I approach mentorship. I, I'm a very shy person, so for me to initiate a video call is also, it's something that I've had to learn. Like, yes, it's okay, it's not weird. Um, <laughs> but I, I was one of those people who grew up afraid of the telephone too, so. <laughs> uh, we'll yeah, I, I have a, I'm not, not sure if it's a question or a comment or whatever, but um, uh, I, I'm confused now uh, when you talk about mentorship, uh, some, in some, uh, some comments say mentorship like in Fedora infrastructure and then they, they jump into Fedora newcomers and uh, I now <laughs> I'm confused because it's very different to mentor uh, someone that is already a Fedora user and wants to contribute to the project than to mentor a new guy that's uh, it's first Linux experience. So I'm, I'm not sure if you're referring uh, to both or just to uh, onboarding, uh, helping onboarding in, to contribute to the project. Our aim here is, as uh, we have mentioned in the goal, that everybody in Fedora is a mentor. So whether it is in the infra team, in join SIG, or wherever they stand. In some or other way, they are mentoring other people. Somewhere it are more organized, more formal, and somewhere it is not. And that's why we are organizing this, so that we can take away all the inputs from different pockets of Fedora, and we can make, and we can work on it, and we can make a more formalized and organized and a balanced mentorship experience for people. I think the difference you're calling out is the difference between mentoring somebody to become a user and mentoring somebody to be a contributor, and my assumption, I could be wrong, so please correct me, no, was this is right. about contributor mentorship. Mm -hmm. That is all, yeah. Now, now I'm not confused, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that, I would like to shift the topic here to a very important subject. Uh, we all know how important it is to have the contributors in any open source com community. And having mentors, onboarding programs, internship, it is the first step how the person will be welcomed in any of the, these op open source community. This is their very first experiences and that is how they feel that this community is. So, what do you think, how we can strategize our diversity and inclusion policies within the mentorship so that everybody feel welcomed? 
I always lean on the outreachy program for that. <laughs> so whatever their guidelines are, they usually make a ton of sense and I just copy them shamelessly. <laughs> <laughs> That's also, by the way, when Jess mentioned the 12 week program, that, that was totally ripped from outreachy. <laughs> so I can add something. Um, for me, I have a slightly technical I mean, slightly different definition to diversity and inclusion, at least uh, from a mentoring standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, so QM and uh, mentees, uh, they, they go above and beyond to do certain level of testing, right, for us. There are, there's one thing that I always keep in mind as a, as a mentor is if they're coming from an academic background and as, as in their students, and they probably are somebody who is uh, coming from a, 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 prop, a society where there is not much of internet access. Mm -hmm. Like they probably have one GB of data limit on their cellular networks. If I make them download a 2.9 gig image every now and mm -hmm. then, that's not gonna be sustainable. So I, so when, when I say policy, when you talked about diversity policies, I think one of those things we, we should try to do is maybe use minimal amount of mm -hmm. resources uh, that a person has to prerequisite before they start contribution. So that way, you know, we don't force people to have like, you know, download GBs of data or have a machine which is, uh, let's say, i7 plus something, right? And, and that way, we kind of lower down the way. Test days are very good in doing that because test days are testing very, very specific features mm -hmm. and uh, they kind of help out when you basically give it to a, uh, contributor, it's a bite-sized bite task, hardly takes two hours to do it. And that way they contribute, but they don't have to expend a lot of resources on their end to start doing it. So I, I so that's, that's one key differential change mm -hmm. in my definition of diversity in terms of technical contributions, yeah. That's a very nice practical uh, input in that regard, I would say. Yes, please, go ahead. I would say it's probably collaborative with the DEI teams, and I think the DEI team should be more vocal in some cases to supporting mentors, right, and making sure that they understand, you know, that as Fedora as a community, they know the different DEI programs that exist within Fedora. There's multiple teams, there's the overarching DEI group, there's all the initiatives that we're doing, but I think it's, it's kind of a, a collaboration that needs to occur, right? I think. Um, mentors who are, you know, taking on mentees, right, should be aware and, and reaching out to DEI, right, and joining kind of the DEI programs, at least just kind of as a casual, you know, kind of casual observer almost, right, but also, you know, as DEI, we need to do a better job of publicizing and saying, hey, these programs exist, they're there to support contributors, they're there to make uh, people feel safe, right, and, and I think that's a big thing that we need to maybe improve upon a little bit is making that a little bit more vocal, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think to add on to that, it's really important for mentors to know when they can't answer something or can't deal with something and talk to their mentors. You know, it, it isn't just you and the mentee or the mentee and the mentor, it's, you know, the community is around you too, so if somebody asks you a hard question or you don't know how to handle it or something like that, do reach out to your mentor or DEI or, you know, the appropriate place. and. Um, I, th I hope that most mentors know that they should do that. I also think, um, and I'd actually be really curious, sorry to call you out, Amy, but I'd be really curious on what you know about like the OpenStack and Kubernetes communities, because I, I recently submitted to um, a, a KubeCon side conference this week, they're due, I think, on Sunday. Um, and what I was actually really impressed by, just submitting to the conference, the amount of references to the community's DEI policies, how they collected information about the, um, the speaker's self-provided um, background information and how they take those policies seriously in considering talks. Yeah, and I'm gonna call Justin out on this. A lot of that is because the apply for the chaos badging program um, Kubernetes is very good. I mean, historically, they have been gold, 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 gold. Um, anytime we had an issue from the chaos badging program and said, hey, we can't find this, we can't find that, they were the most awesome on getting it fixed. Um, they also have the most funding, 
one of the reasons why open infra the first year got silver is because of liability and other things, we don't provide childcare. We can't. Um, but yet the second time this past year when we applied, we got gold because we explained what certain things and we're better about having things on the website. So the easiest way to get a gold badging program is to have everything out there easy to find and that's why you had that experience. Um, the conferences themselves are run really well on their code of conduct. Um, they're very good about having diversity tickets, diversity travel. They've got funding behind them, especially Linux Foundation. I'm curious. I, I guess Amit has done a pretty good job of putting together a diverse panel here. So if obviously if only if people feel comfortable sharing, but do any of us have like experiences from a diversity perspective with mentoring or being a mentee, like positive or negative, like how was it? I mean, personally, I'm somewhere on the 2S LGBTQ, I, I'm forgetting all the letters spectrum. Um, but for me, it's never been a huge issue, so I don't really have a great perspective on it, but I'm curious if it has been in the experiences of everyone else on the panel. I mean, I've been on both sides of that, and I think, um, I think one of the challenges is that if you're not from the same identity markers, I don't know what's the right word to say, I'm, so I apologize if I'm saying something terrible, but if, if you don't have the same identities as the person you are mentoring, or if as a mentee you don't have the same identities as the person who is your mentor, there's definitely a, like a bit of a trust that has to be established, and depending on the the timeline of the mentorship and how how you've built that, how, where you are in your journey to building that trust, it can be difficult when situations arise to be able to handle them correctly or perfectly, and I feel like perfection is not human, so don't tr strive for perfection. But, well, maybe you should strive for it, but just don't beat yourself up if you don't meet it, yeah. <laughs> but I, one of the things, so, so when you were saying how the, it would be interesting for the DEI communities, say within Fedora, to be a support to mentors. I think that's actually a brilliant idea because for me, again, like I had an issue vaguely recently with a mentee, not Jess, um, <laughs> where um, they, they were a member of a community I was not a member of and I absolutely support that community, um, but I'm not a member so I can't make calls about what is okay and what's not okay and stuff like that. And if I had like the DEI group affiliated with that identity that I could go to and just have an open, honest conversation where it's like there's no wrong or bad question to ask. Like for the next half hour, what stays in this meeting stays in this meeting. Um, can I just ask you these questions so I can understand where the issue is? So then I can kind of, and maybe even sit with me as a member of that community and help me work out a strategy for how we can get past this road bump. Um, I think that would have been helpful. I ended up just going up my management chain and asking for help and guidance and it got through it. I wish it had been resolved better. And this is a recent thing I was thinking through. Um, the issues that I had were related to being female um, and they happened a long time ago and it was a very different community. <laughs> just generally, um, I, I would not recommend what happened to me. So I'm not going to say anything about that. That's, that's exactly I wanted to say that. that. This is a challenge that if the person is not from maybe same gender, same time zone, it is difficult to convey that. I remember that one of the feedback I got uh, from one of the person from US that when I visited US, they said that you are a completely different person and very energetic. I thought you always were very lazy to take meetings I said, because it is totally opposite time zone, and <laughs> I, I'm finishing my day, and you are all excited, uh, and starting your day with a cup of coffee, and I even remember that when I, when Adam was there in QE, and um, I was just uh, joining uh, Fedora a few years back, a lot of years back, <laughs> then, um, it was very hard to connect with him uh, being in Canada and only one famous community guy in uh, QE and really very hard to you know, connect with him. So I think it is very, very important 
uh, from the diversity perspective, not just gender-wise or, uh, you know, teams-wise or it's uh, time zone-wise. To have people all across the globe and all different kind of people. So it is very important. Yes, please. Um, uh, yeah, so this is something that, uh, well, I also experienced uh, the difference of cultures. Uh, so what you want to convey or what you want to say might not be what would be perceived, let's just say. So um, two things always help, you know, first having empathy, you know, putting yourself in somebody else's shoe and understand, hmm, would they really uh, understand it how I want them to understand or would it take it the other way around because, well, cultures differ, so what you want to say might not get there. You know, it's all UDP, you know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> the other thing is also being open to making mistakes because, well, we're human beings. And uh, like Kevin said, you know that, you know, if you're a mentor, you're mentoring someone else and uh, there are situations that you know that you might not be correct or you don't really know how to address that. So, you, well, you reach back to your mentors and ask them. Maybe they have an idea about how you can address that situation and, um, well, I can say it for a fact that it did help me uh, progressing through my mentorship challenges, you know. Yeah, um, I think like, uh, so I, I do quite a bit of mentoring outside of, the, uh, outside of Red Hat I'm on a website where you can just volunteer your time as a mentor or mentee. And I think I learned the most by mentoring people that were not from my culture. Right? And it's always like, I think we forgot, like the, for me a mentorship relationship is really like bi-directional. Like every time a mentee asks me like, oh, but why do you give your time for this? So when we have a conversation, I'm going to learn as much as you because you're going to bring like challenging problems, you're going to bring different point of view, different perspective. And I think that's where the diversity aspect is very, very important and very powerful. Like, so that's where you have an impact on both people's life. Uh, uh, if I mentor someone that is exactly like me, we're going to think the, the same way. We go, we're not going to have like this creativity or difference of, uh, of background, culture, and, uh, and opinion. So I think it's, yeah, it's very um, important to have like that diversity in the mentors, mentee, and uh, time zones, uh, religion, sex, bio, like yeah, all the. Um, that's what. That's how you learn and you grow. I think that's like the, the goal of the mentorship is to to grow and to develop yourself and learn from others. Yeah, so with this, uh, we can maintain the continuity. And a similar thought is that we. Can we have one more question, please? Uh, yes, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, I'll try to make this as succinct as possible. Um, so the, on the idea of trying to make people more welcome in the community, which I think is the, the general uh, section that we're talking about here, um, my understanding of the structured programs like Outreach, e, GSOC, things like that, they're great, they'll bring people in that may not have come into the community by themselves. Then there's, uh, as you talked about, the informal mentorships that happen. Um, and those would be people finding their way and finding mentorships, finding mentors within the community. Um, I come from a slightly different background. I'm not currently very active at all in, in Fedora, but I mentor a few people but I, I work in an office, so it's really easy for me to see where mentees are struggling because I see them every day. So my question is sort of around, do you think there are any gaps between the structured programs, and this is sort of going to where Mo was saying, like some sort of a middle ground between the structured programs and then the, the informal mentoring relationships that happen do you think there could be any gaps and sort of an idea around, and maybe this happens already, I'm not sure, because I know some of you up, up there are very high profile people in the Fedora community and um, I wonder if 
newer people might find it difficult to approach you because you're seen as so busy and doing so much stuff and involved in so many conversations. So coming from the office background where I can just walk up the corridor and interrupt people and see how they're doing and stuff. Um, is there any concept of like uh, office hours where there's like, I don't know, ask, you can book 15 minutes, 30 minutes with Kevin or with Adam or with Mo um, in your calendar where you've blocked off time to, to, for, for people to approach you rather than hoping that they will. I think to, to summarize this, I, I think it's more of a question of approachability if we, we, we have people not in, within the same premises, right? I can take that, I mean, start with that. So Red Hat Lung, uh, runs this awesome program called Red Hat Link Up. Uh, essentially, uh, they, send, they pair you up with some, somebody, uh, mostly from other part of the world, and you get to have a one hour conversation with them about anything general life and stuff. Every time, so I'm a part of LinkUp since last one year. I've met like brilliant people. Like uh, I, I met Sim Zacks. Um, if, if you have worked in Kiwi, you know who that is. Um, essentially, uh, every time I met people, I kind of, and they were interested in contributing to test days, open source, something. I would basically be like, yeah, you know, we can set up a cadence of calls where you can probably ask me questions and if, if I cannot solve it, I would forward them to Adam or somebody who can uh, answer it on the behalf. And it has, it, it actually gives us that exact point you told me. That it, it sets up that bridge between me and somebody that I don't know, I, I would probably never know, uh, to still approach me and then keep a cadence call if, if they want to maintain it that way. So it has, it has all, that, that kind of program has always helped me do that. But that's, that's one program. So I, I am part of that program since last one year. And I keep doing it every, um, twice every week. Uh, this year, uh, this time, no, because of conferences. But yeah, and usually twice a week I meet people and I help them out uh, wherever they are. Usually people have problems with, oh, my Fedora Wi-Fi is not working or something is not working. So it's fun to debug those as well, right? <laughs> but then you get some experience and they get some learning, yeah. I, I think, I don't have an answer to it, but I think it's a fantastic question. And I think, yes, there may well be gaps. Um, because you do see a lot of people show up to a community and not necessarily continue. And that may well be the case that they needed a mentor, but they didn't get one. So I think it's absolutely a great question. And the answer may well be that we could do a lot more there. And I like the office hours idea, so I may actually do that. So thank you for that. <laughs> I suppose as well, like when I was starting off like my internship in Red Hat, like contributing to Fedora, I was still in college. So like I'd be working six to 10 my time, but for Mo it was one to five. So it was working hours for Mo. So I felt like, you know, I wasn't impeding on like your like, um, you know, you're off, off hours time. Um, but I suppose now, um, or like before, uh, especially in the summer, I'd be going into the office working nine to five hours time. So I'd be texting Mo at like 12 o'clock when it's like seven o'clock her time, hoping not to wake her up. <laughs> um, and, um, but I feel like you're quite available when it comes to like asking people. So I, I feel comfortable messaging Mo at, at any time. So, but I think you need to, you need to limit your time. <laughs> you need to take a break. <laughs> so. One, I, I've had that same issue and I work with teams in other regions and the thing that I keep telling myself is people can structure their notifications how they need. So I'm not gonna worry about waking someone up. If they want, don't wanna be woken up, they can turn off their thing. But um, the, the thing that I wanted to say is I think office hours are brilliant. In, in, for me and Jas, one of our weekly sync ups is basically the Fedora design team meeting. We also have weekly CDT, um, which is community design team. So that's because 
we started out as a Fedora design team, but then we were working with other communities that were not necessarily Fedora, like Podman would be a main one. Um, although, yes, they're very much integrated in Fedora. But, um, you know, so it's like, well, it's the Fedora design team. People don't know they can approach us, so we'll come up with a more neutral name so that other communities we're affiliated with know they can approach us. But, um, yeah, I think having a, a regular meeting cadence is really good. And then people, if somebody says, oh, I have a friend who would love to work on design stuff, Mo, how can they meet up? I'll just say, oh, come to the regular Fedora design team meetings. Now, they're at a specific time. If you can't make that time, what we do is we do a live stream and then the recording is auto uploaded. So people could at least watch the recording and get a feel for is this the group for me or not. And then if they want, I, we always offer, you could always book a meeting with us um, you know, a one-on-one -on -one in a time that works for you. So, uh, but I, y your point is very good. And I think for me, I, I tend to like the structured programs because they force me to check in. Because I'm not like a super social person, so I don't always think. Like, I, I'm, I'm used to people like pinging me and I'm not normally the person to arrange the parties or yeah. call someone. I'm usually the person answering the phone or going to the party. So um, having something like Outreachy has the structured weekly check-ins. And those, just having the fact that the structure exists and I have to do it, makes me do it. So that's why I think some, some kind of structure like that, um, some sort of thing where even if it's an informal mentorship, but you know, the timelines I think of an informal mentorship are longer, so maybe not a weekly check-in, maybe a monthly roundup, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, so totally, uh, totally agree. Uh, but one thing I wanna point out is like an infrastructure uh, Monday through Thursday, we do a stand-up twice a day, every day, and we just go over stuff, and, and then we have like a period where we say, anybody have any questions, you know, ask whatever you want, that's fine, but how many people know about that? <laughs> We're very bad about, you know, directing the people who might need those resources to that kind of th stuff, and every once in a while I keep thinking that, that maybe we need a Fedora directory assistance or something, mm -hmm. you know, somebody to... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Where do I go for this? Oh, you go talk to that team over there. Um, and yeah, but definitely we could do more in that in that gap to answer your question. I just want to cross the streams and say um, in discourse, if anybody was in that, <laughs> maybe because I don't know. The discourse experts have told me there's events integration. So I'm just wondering if we could have these um, open calls where people can ask questions listed as events in discourse and we can make that the central hub. Sounds good. No, I was just saying, I think you had something to say. Uh, do you have something uh, regarding this topic or do you want to ask another question? Okay, cool. Yeah, 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 cool. So the only thing I wanted to add was that I love office hours as well and we try and do some of them in Ansible. AWX is doing office hours, but I do feel that it still puts the onus on the person coming, right? So Mo made the point that you're not the one who's going to start the call, right? But does that mean if you were a mentee in another community, would you feel comfortable jumping into an office hours any more than you would, say, asking for help on GitHub or wherever, right? It's still the same problem. How do we get people to come? Isn't solved by office hours. It's another medium. It's good. We should do it, yes. But we still have to figure out how to get people. If, if as Adam said, people drift away because they didn't get the help they need, would they have had the initiative to come to the open office hours as well? I don't know that it solves that problem. Uh, I don't have a good answer to that, right? Getting people to come to things is always the problem. So one of the things that I've done personally, when I've been reaching out to Kevin, who lives a world apart from me, uh, time zones can be a pain. So um, we use asynchronous mediums of communication, right? So uh, a bunch of times you can't make it to office hours because, well, time zones. You can drop a ping instead, and you can trust them that they have their notifications off, because guess what? The time that you might be pinging them is probably they're asleep at that time, right? But you can be pretty sure that they're not nice enough that they're going to respond to you back when they'll be awake, and that's, that's a good start, I guess. I have the problem you're, you're talking about. Uh, I was just trying to help uh, a friend that I work with uh, to package, to, just to put a patch in a package. Uh, and he, he's an old guy, well, we're in our 40s, so we're old guys in, in <laughs> computer years. Um, and, and he was overwhelmed by all the, he called it, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not it's, it's not my, I'm quoting, uh, all the buro bu bureaucracy around being a packager. And I was trying to mentor him and, and give him some guidance, pasting stuff, 
but I didn't do the office hours thing. So I'm, I'm going to do that. When I back, go back to, to Mexico, I'm just going to, let's sit and, well, it's remote. Let's make a call and let's go through the process. And th this, this w was very good advice. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And I would uh, like to add to that to set the expectations right in advance before jumping directly to the to that video call or office hour. Maybe f uh, to kick off with, you can start with informal one. But going forward, when you are devoting your time, the other person is devoting their time, set the expectations and ed agenda in advance so that you are prepared and the other guy is also uh, well prepared. With that, uh, I would like to take the uh, next question. We'll come to you as well, uh, because I have some set of questions which I really would like to be uh, in within the time. Uh, so we have seen, and this is the question came in yesterday as well on one of the social media channel, that some of the Fedora groups are doing really well in mentorship. And some of them are not yet there. So how do you think the learnings and uh, motivation, the force, the support, how we can give that to those uh, groups which are not there yet? I know that the design team, QE team, all of you are doing fantastic to uh, support our new contributors and bringing them in the community. How we can, uh, you know, build that cult culture across other Fedora six and teams and groups? I think each team needs a flywheel. It's mm -hmm. sort of quote Ben Cotton. Mm -hmm. um, and I think where I see teams within Fedora struggle is they don't have like an identified flywheel. So it could be either there really is nobody with the time or motivation to do it, or it could be nobody feels they have permission. What? Uh, that's one of the things that I think is the early mentee thing that you have to get over. It's like you don't have to ask permission. You know, we have a saying at Red Hat, it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. <laughs> um, and some people are afraid, like, should I do this thing? Yes, if you want to do it, please do it. But um, I, I think that is the one thing that, like, it's not going to happen. I can give people all the advice in the world, but if they don't feel empowered to actually do it, or if there isn't anybody who has the time or commitment to be able to be that team's flywheel, it's just not going to happen. Like, you need the people. But if you do have the people, I think, again, I've said this before, looking at how Outreachy does it is a really good way. Like, everything mm -hmm. that they do is just such top-notch from just the, the inclusive language that they use in all their documentation to how they have it laid out to all of the things that they recommend. So I think for any team within Fedora or any team within any open source project, definitely look to them. And from some of the stuff Amy's saying, I think I want to look at the Kubernetes community too and mm -hmm. kind of steal from them. Mm -hmm. uh, what's a flywheel? Um, I, I, I think you could do it better, but th that was something that Ben Cotton, our former program manager, sadly laid off, which we're all still salty about, um, used to say, he, he, you need a person on a team who will be there, who can be relied upon to be there and make things happen. And you, you don't want people to sort of fall into a gap where they, they want to help out and no one is there to help them. And that person generally needs to be paid by somebody, so it's their responsibility to do this thing. So, I mean, for our team, Samantro is the, the flywheel. You can rely on him to be there. If community stuff is happening, he is going to be there organizing it, and people can reach out to him. Mm -hmm. So, that's the idea of the flywheel. And that's why I like to say that Outreach as a program is really good because they pay the interns, because you can't expect somebody to work that intensively and not have a paycheck. Uh, I, I see that you keep mentioning this. I really want to know that what is the best way, because it, it, it takes a different kind of effort and determination to go and read each and every outreach uh, mentorship page, but how best we can get that lesson learned and bring it to our community and implement it? Maybe the mentor summit. <laughs> <laughs> like maybe no but no like I, I would envision maybe a training like it could be a talk here mm -hmm. and it could be it could, doesn't have to be very long of like a half hour thing of these are best mm -hmm. practices learned from outreachy okay and it could go mm -hmm. through and say you know the 12 week plan I think mm -hmm. is a great one because 12 is a wonderful number you can do you can do three weeks for four 
projects like three weeks each, or you could do three projects four weeks each, or you could do six and two either way. It's just a nice number, and depending on how complex the technical project is you're looking at, or mm -hmm. just you know what what skill set the the intern would like to learn. Like if they just want want to learn one thing, maybe you do six by two. If they want to learn four different things, you do a four by three breakdown mm -hmm. of the schedule. And the fact that you're doing these weekly schedule, the, these weekly check-ins, mm -hmm. and you're going through the schedule and making sure, like updating it to match the work that was actually completed. Because you know the thing the thing about outreachy too. When I've done many outreachy internship. Um, mentorships, it's, it's intimidating to, you have to come up with a schedule as part of the application process. Mm -hmm. But then it never works out the way you planned it. And there's no shame in that, it's good. If you did it exactly the way that you put it out when you sent in your application, you're doing something wrong. Because mm -hmm. you learn in week one, oh, I can't do that thing in week four. Mm -hmm. So that continual checking in on the plan, mm -hmm. and honestly, I think that's something Florida could do generally, is mm -hmm. we have this strategy, mm -hmm. let's check in and see how we're doing mm -hmm. on a regular cadence. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, that's one specific thing is that 12-week plan thing I think is brilliant. Um, there's other things too, like they have topics every week that they talk about. Um, like one I remember I, I attended with an intern was the, the resume building one and how to talk to recruiters, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. It's jobs focused, but having like a list of these general topics mm -hmm. that maybe, you know, if we have a community within Fedora, like it could be the join SIG, I don't know, mm -hmm. some community that would maybe have these sort of trainings too. And, I think the other thing is that we do talk about this stuff a lot, and it's everything is video chat <laughs> recorded since mm -hmm. COVID. We have this rich library material on our YouTube channel, and like I remember specific talks I saw that I found informative, but like Jess might not know that that talk that Marie gave about you know making badges exists, mm -hmm. but I do. So could we have some sort of library? And again, I, I will cross the streams and say maybe Discourse could have a video <laughs> library thing to point to the videos so we could build a training center that kind yeah, of goes through these general mm -hmm. topics so then people have something to reference. But you always want to keep the material fresh. Right. So, and I don't know the cadence of Fedora Mentor Summit, but mm -hmm. it could be something that we're reevaluating every summit mm -hmm. and then we're posting those fresh videos and making sure they're listed. So I, I really like these uh, ideas and it's like, uh, logistic and providing the right material, rep maintaining the repository and all of that. But the real challenge which I also uh, observe and, and seen across the board is that the same faces, the same teams coming and stepping in into the mentorship and being the mentor. The main thing is here, how, like we talked about how important it is to have that diverse pool of people mentoring each other. How can we motivate and encourage more people to be mentor? Um, so one of those things we used to do back in the day is called Triple T, Train the Trainer. Um, essentially a, a series of a two-day program where a trainer would basically take up multiple other trainers and be like, here's how I mentored my people and I found these few things that did not work for me do you have a suggestion of how I can curate them? And that has been actually a very nice way of uh, correcting flaws in the mentorship program. So you don't have to entirely change your strategy towards mentorship. You just have to fix uh, the small problems and they can come from experience of other mentors, right? So that's one thing that we have actually uh, nailed down as a part of uh, the mentorship uh, summit. We try to ensure that there are more mentors and they kind of give feedback to other mentors saying, uh, hey, we have been trying to do this, this is failing. Uh, we don't think this is working at 100%. Can we have some suggestions around certain topics? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to call back on this to maybe some earlier points, like Mo's idea of some kind of middle ground. And I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but your idea of contributors who are getting lost, sorry. Darren? Jared, sorry, yep, Jared. Um, your idea about contributors getting lost, because I think if we had some kind of very light Fedora how to be a mentor program, that would really help with this a lot, because you know, as a QA team, we don't have our own mentorship program exactly. If we had something project-wide where people coming in, we could say, oh, we've got new people coming in. Does anyone want to be a mentor? It's not this intensive six-month 
program. It's mm -hmm. just go and read these three docs pages about this is how you do our very in middle ground form of mentoring. It's not scary. Now you can go and help out the new people. I feel like that might really help with you know a few different things here. Um, I mean, I think your point too about oh well, there's only certain teams and they keep showing up and the other teams don't show up. I think the thing to keep in mind is we are very upstream focused, and I think for example, like and I don't mean to call teams out, but you might not necessarily see like the Fedora kernel team mm -hmm. in these programs, but that's because there's programs like Sumantra mentioned, the kernel newbies program. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, I think teams rely on their upstream. And I think where you see like Fedora design team showing up a mm -hmm. lot, it's because we're our own upstream. Like mm -hmm. nobody's really upstream of us. Mm -hmm. So obviously we need to do the mentorship. And it, I think it's okay, like I think it's okay, but I think what we do need to do is identify where if you want to get involved in a specific Fedora team, mm -hmm. but the mentorship program is upstream, we need to say, hey, you're interested in working on the Fedora kernel, look at the kernel newbies program. Or if mm -hmm. you're interested in working on the desktop and Fedora workstation, look at GNOME's mentorship programs. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things where maybe we need to have the references upstream that we don't have. That's a really good point. Please go ahead. Oh, yeah, please, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, <laughs> All right, so it's, it's a bit of a meandering question, but I think I can condense it, but I wanna say a couple things first. All right, first thing is uh, research has shown that uh, labor unrelated to the actual production of, of software is uh, pretty much universally devalued in open source, regardless of people's intentions. People feel bad about doing this sort of work. So this is one thing that we, we know for sure, right? Um, the, the second thing is that, you know, generally with mentorship in open source, because everything's on a goodwill basis, uh, the, the people within the community, the mentors, have more power than the mentees, right? They have existing responsibilities. So naturally, without any other sort of interventions, uh, mentees, regardless of the goodwill or the intentions of the mentors, are expected to engage with on the terms of the mentor, right? And I think a good example of this is uh, thinking about like time zones, right? And, and why it was always having to engage with mentors in the community that are based in America uh, on their time zones, right? Uh, and then the third thing I wanted to, not to like, I don't want to, stir the pot or cause drama. But I went to Justin's talk yesterday about how to spend Fedora's money. And it was all about events, right? Which I thought was interesting, because I'm like, oh yeah, we, all of us here that are part of this community, yeah, we like going to events and seeing each other, and you know, I enjoy being here too. Uh, but everything else is, okay, not everything else. We're talking about fly, flywheels, and there are like Red Hat paid staff positions that you know, haven't been laid off yet, but <laughs> Uh, and I don't want to stir that pot either, but I think it's, you know, <laughs> we're talking about Ben Cotton and many other people that, you know, uh, whose, whose layoff was arbitrary at best and discriminatory at worst. Um, and so I want to, my, my question is about a devotion of resources that this community has access to, and not just like the people in this room, but also like, you know, the, the, the budget that we have. And historically, a lot of this budget has been around like, you know, celebrations and flock and events and stuff like that. Do we feel like that needs to change? And to grow this community, we need to devote monetary resources to, you know, as you said, flywheels or, you know, devoted staff positions around mentorship and these sort of roles. And if so, what, what do you envision those things to be? Um, before we start, I just uh, want to uh, pitch in there that DEI team in Fedora has been contributing the budget uh, for the mentorship as well. So, uh, so I, Matthew Miller started this conference uh, keynote with one point which was uh, State of Fedora and one of those points was if in, anyone in this room who has a budget for diversity advisor role can actually come and help Fedora to get somebody full time there. That was one of the points which was made by the project leader. That can give us the last point that you asked for mostly, the, the, the budget part. The second stuff uh, which is actually there right now, um, I 
was while we were doing this diversity weeks, Federal Diversity Weeks, Federal Week of Diversity, FWD, FTW, something, <laughs> uh, uh, essentially, you could actually reimburse the certification that you were doing on diversity. And that was a good way to actually help and get more community members, or rather more flywheels, to understand what diversity and inclusion means, right? That, uh, I, I have, not a great idea on specifics of from where do you get these courses and whatnot, but I know there's a budget allocated which you can use up. And Justin may have exact information on yeah. the amounts at this point. We also sponsor, uh, in the past, we sponsored the outreach intern as well with the Fedora DEI budget. Um, I know because I was there, so Justin has the exact numbers, of course. Well, I, I don't want to <laughs> step in if anyone else does want to comment on how resources are allocated in Fedora for these kind of things. But I do want to just acknowledge the point, too, that in Fedora, since, at least since I've been involved in 2015, we've always had a diversity allocation in the public Fedora budget for things like we were doing with sponsoring outreachy interns in the Fedora community. Mm -hmm. um, but also things that we've done across the year, like the Appreciation Weeks, the uh, formerly uh, Fedora Women's Day, now Fedora Week of Diversity, where we were doing, before COVID, like in-person events, and we, we had them in five different continents of people organizing these community spaces in their local communities. But I think the challenge that we have now is, especially as we're coming out of COVID, you know, there are resources that we have in the community, and those are things that I think a lot of people may not realize are available or um, are, are not exposed very well. So, you know, on one hand, you know, it is a team, like this is also how the DEI team has been able to do some of our very specific focused projects, but at the same time, I think wider input on how to best prioritize and uh, make sure that we're creating opportunities for people to share how we can more equitably use our resources for mentoring for supporting greater diversity in the community. You know, I think that's probably the, the challenge is we do need to have a, a larger conversation about that and finding the right balance of getting wider feedback and input and making sure that we're not trying to do too many things at one time. I think that's also been the challenge is we've had resources and then it's a smaller group of people who, no, it's not just that part, but it's just it's harder to, uh, to scale. So I think there's, there's multiple pieces there, but I just wanted to comment that about the budget piece mm -hmm. and you know uh, there are resources but probably the conversation is how can we be more open about and transparent about those resources and use them in a more well continue to use them in a equitable way and making sure that we're still uh, improving proving that in the community thank you justin for I, your input i think when we look at the allocation of resources there's like two dimensions to think about and that's is it a one-shot deal from the funding perspective or is it an ongoing thing from the funding perspective? And then on the other side, think about the outcomes. Is the outcome a one-shot deal or is the outcome ongoing? I think events tend to be a one-shot deal in one sense at the individual level. Oh, I got to go to Flock this year. I won't necessarily come next year. But, I, I don't say that because I wouldn't want to go, I'm just saying because of funding. <laughs> um, but. Because I went, I was able to make the social connections and build the intimacy with others that mm -hmm. when I go back to my remote contribution, right. it will be super powered, at least for a while. Um, so you have sort of an ongoing outcome, and it was sort of a one-shot deal from a funding perspective for me as an individual. I think as a community, an event like Flock I mean, mm -hmm. we don't have to do flock every year. We do. We have not always done flock. We used to do FUDCONs. It was multiple smaller events. Um, but that ends up at a high level budget level, not at the individual level, an ongoing cost. And I think sometimes when we have these conversations, we think of the individual, I had a one-shot deal, and not the fact that this is an ongoing regular cost. Mm -hmm. um, but then also, I think for flywheels, at the individual level, it has to be ongoing. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. You, and I think it's easy to fund programs like Outreachy because they have that 12, 13 week. Mm -hmm. I think it's 13 weeks now. <laughs> um, but they have that specific timeline. And it's a one shot. And you fund it. And you know what your budget looks like. And you can do that. Um, and it is, for the, for the individual receiving it, it is an ongoing benefit. But it's not enough to keep a flywheel. 
a flywheel has to be able to make a living. So, yeah. and that's the level of budget I, Justin could speak to this maybe, I don't think we have that level of budget to hire yeah. multiple people in. If we did, yeah, yeah. Matthew would be, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we would have that diversity mm -hmm. coordinator if we did have that budget. Right, and, uh, yes, please go ahead. So I had a question for the design mentors. Uh, this came up during my outreach internship as well, and recently when I was trying to volunteer for Flock as well. So one of the regions I struggled while contributing to Fedora was using the open source design tools. And I think I've been vocal about it for a very long time. I have been trying to discuss this, and I've gone to different open source communities discussing the same issues and how they are dealing it. So, uh, like, for better or worse, it matters to me what design tool I use. And I've been using proprietary design tools for a longer time. So when I came to Fedora, I saw that you all were using open source design tools, and I'm nothing against it. It's just that I know I'm more efficient while using the tools of my choice. So I just wanted to know, uh, like, what matters more to a mentor, like the contributions that are being made or the tools that are being chosen to make the contributions? And is there any way that we can find a middle ground between new contributors who just want to use their tool of choice so that they can start contributing first and then maybe switching? Or, I mean, it's just that if I use a tool of my choice, I know I'll be more efficient, I can contribute more. And if I am, like, pushed to to like push to use prop, like different open source design tools, I just know that I'll be frustrated and my will to contribute goes down. That's all. Thanks for the question. Like I can take that. Um, so I, I would be the czar of making people use open source tools <laughs> in the design team. Um, I, I have a lot of reasons for that and I understand as an individual, you invest a lot of time into your tools and it is a huge ask and I can say this, I, you were in the discourse session. <laughs> Asking me to use discourse is a huge ask because I have the tools I already have that I like, but um, I'm being open-minded. I have tried discourse a number of times. Matthew says he's gonna sit down with me and fix it for me, so. But the, the bit about that too, like I would be fighting that way more tooth and nail and the, the fire alarm would have gone off multiple times in that session if it was proprietary. Because Fedora is really, I, I see us as an open source first community. And it's not just because of the dogma of open source and software freedom. It's um, the, the reason I am so passionate about using open source design tools is that when I was a student, um, I was a freshman, and actually I had started working with this tool called Macromedia Director as a high schooler at an engineering summer camp. Um, so I was the director girl, so anytime it was like a video project or what I would use director. By the time I was a senior, so this is within four years, I don't know if Adobe had already bought Macromedia at that point, but director, they, they, you couldn't even buy it. Like, you couldn't get a copy of it. And I had all these projects in my portfolio that I couldn't play them, and I couldn't open the files to edit them because I didn't have a copy of the DVD. It came preloaded on my laptop. Um, so for, for me to apply to jobs and have a portfolio, like, I had all this work I couldn't use. It was locked up in a proprietary format requiring a proprietary tool, and that really sucked. So that's why I'm passionate about the open source tools. I think it's a practical consideration when you think about BitRot. I think it's a practical consideration when you think about accessibility. A lot of these tools cost money. A lot of them cost money on a subscription model now, where it's, hey, you know what? Pay us ransom and you can access your files, otherwise, no. <laughs> and it's like, yes, I, you know, I understand that maybe the way the open source design tools work is different. Like, I'm not, when I go into the discourse session, I'm like, this is so uncomfortable, I don't like it, I have to learn all this stuff. I understand that it works perfectly well for other people who are used to that system. So I don't think it's an issue of the tool having a problem, it's the having to retrain yourself. And the investment of having to do that with a tool that you're already familiar with, that it's like your right hand or your third hand or something, that it's so natural. I understand that's a big ask, but I think for us as a team, it's really important from volunteers coming into the team, contributing something, if they give us assets, and yet they could be beautiful, could be the most perfect design ever. If it's in a format that I can't open with tools that I can access, it might as well not have existed because say it's something for Flock and we have to update it with the, with the dates for next year. If I can't open the file, I'm gonna to have to remake it mm -hmm. from scratch. Mm -hmm. 
So it's really important, I think, to think about the format of the files that it outputs. You have to think about can other people access the tool that was used to make it. Um, you also have to think about the point of Fedora is to be an open source project. So. Yeah. Uh, I would quickly jump onto that because we just have a few minutes left and I would like to take some time to conclude as well. Yeah. So please, uh, gentlemen, go Yeah, ahead. one more question. Oh. Do I have Yeah. No, we have time to take one more question. Okay, one more question, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Oh, I guess my question. <laughs> uh, I guess my question is kind of a little bit more, uh, you know, obviously most of us here are folks who hack away at things, right? I mean, I've heard today a lot of things about, um, you know, we need to understand who our mentors are. We need to understand, I mean, it's almost kind of a data question. I think I've also heard about the funding, the resources, and making sure that those things are there. I think as a community, we have a lot of tooling around things like badges and rewards and recognition. I mean, is there any opportunity to leverage Fedora to do this, right? Can we leverage, you know, show who's a mentor, show who's, you know, who is being mentored by someone else. Can we recognize that and then start to understand who is becoming a mentor because of this, right? Um, I mean, I mean, heck, could we put that in FAST, right? Literally show who's, who's mentoring, right? Like, I don't know about, you know, for most folks, but, you know, being able to award a badge or some kind of recognition would be an amazing thing to do. So I, just throwing it out there, folks have ideas or what your thoughts are. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's totally something we could do. Um, and that's sort of a project-wide thing, right? And a lot of the mentoring stuff is per team, so we would have to get some sort of buy-in at you know some sort of mentor summit of some kind about that. Uh, but yeah, we could totally do badges or some kind of relationship. But one of the problems there is that um, a lot of the relationships are ephemeral, right? So you're a mentor for a month, and then the person goes somewhere else or whatever. Or you're mentoring like five people and you know some of them are you're seeing every week and some of them you're seeing every month and uh, so there's that kind of complexity to it also but I think you're right that some sort of recognition or some kind of how to find the mentors or you know where to go uh, again we get back to the flywheel you know who who in this in this team or project can direct me to the resources that that I need yeah, I was just going to say it's kind of an interesting comparison with, say, package sponsors or something like that. We could, that's the permanent part, people who are willing to be mentors. Like, the, the individual relationships are fleeting and the mentees may be fleeting, but if we can have something kind of tool-wise which says these are the mentors on this team, that might be really useful, I guess. Mm -hmm. Jess, you want to say a few things? Oh, no, I was, I was going to um, say something on... Um, Anushka's point about the uh, proprietary software. Um, I suppose when when I first joined the Fedora design team, like I had knowledge of, excuse my language, Illustrator uh, before, <laughs> and um, uh, then I. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> um, but uh, that kind of. I suppose it helped me get into Inkscape because there was a lot of stuff that were similar and I know Inkscape has like a feature where you can like um, use like the Illustrator buttons in Inkscape. So like th I suppose that kind of got me into it. But then going back into college and learning Illustrator, I was like, I don't like this piece of software. I'm used to <laughs> I'm used to Inkscape now. So I think it's like I know people learn like in different ways, but I suppose that was that was my experience of it and um you know and, and as Mo was saying, like the freedom of having um you know like like dot SVG can be opened by anything. Dot PSD which is for Photoshop can only be opened by Photoshop. So it's nice to have the that freedom, um, but I do understand where you're coming from with the Figma you were using, so, yeah. So, uh, like, as you pointed out, that .svg can be open anywhere, so recently I just saw that uh, Inkscape SVGs are not supported on Figma or other modern design tools, so that's, I mean, the problem is the open source design tools that uh, the community has been using. Sometimes a lot of files from those uh, tools are not supported on modern design tools and modern software. Like, uh, it's not just Figma, there's uh, like Sketch and uh, Framer, 
which do not support these files. And the, like, my point is not using just one tool. I'm just asking if there could be ways that people could use the tool of their choice, not changing uh, the entire community's tool of choice. Like, if you want to work with open source design tools, you have the free will to do that. And if I do not want to do that, I have the free will to do that. That's the, the, the problem is, is we don't work in a silo. We work together as a team. So we need to agree on the tools we use. That's why, for example, I'm willing to give discourse a third go. <laughs> because we all have to be there in order for it to work. And I think that when you're saying Inkscape's SVG doesn't open up in Figma, Number one, you can do save as plain SVG on Inkscape, and then it probably should, but if it doesn't, that's Figma's problem. It's not Inkscape's problem, because SVG is a standard, and I know that there are members of the Inkscape team who follow closely and participate in the W3C SVG standard. Um, if proprietary vendors don't want to adhere to that standard, that is their problem. It's not the standard's problem. I also want to say that... Um, Modern tools, I think Inkscape is very much a modern tool, and I don't like the proprietary stuff being said that it's better, and the stuff that's free not, because I don't think just because it's free software means it's less than. Um, it's a different model, it works differently, but for us using Inkscape is really a partnership for us because um, we are pretty close with the upstream Inkscape community. We just spent, me and Madeline spent a lot of time with Martin Owens, who is the lead UX um, developer for Inkscape at Penpot Fest a couple, uh, was it a couple months ago? It was in June, no it was in July. Yeah, it was anyway, in and Penpot is another tool where it is an upstream open source project. We, it is a modern tool very much. There's a lot of large companies that use it. Um, and that's the tool we go because we know the upstream. We have a great relationship with them. There are features in Inkscape right now that were implemented within the past release or two that was Fedora. Oh yeah, sure. Request you both to get into the room and have this conversation. <laughs> so I'm sure. Uh, I, and I just would like to. Con to? What is that? Are we out of time? Over time. Oh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I would like. I would like to conclude this discussion just with one sentence. That in my career, one thing I learned is change is the only constant. Be open-minded, and that is how you will build your resume with different skills, with different tools, okay? With that, I would like to thank you, this lovely audience who has been very, very enthusiastic for the participation. Last night, I was thinking after this long game night and beers and drinks, who would be there? Just maybe five people of panelists, but no, there are people who are very active, and I am so thankful and glad that we had you here. I noticed, uh, note down a very good uh, the conversation, the summary with different learning curves, join SIG, how DEI can contribute, Red Hat link up, Fedora office hours, Fedora directory, outreachy lessons, train the training, fly wheels, very easy three page pager, how to be a mentor, the best practices, exposing the resources that we have wisely. So I'm not going to promise that we're going to implement each one of them, but we will definitely try and focus uh, step by step that how we can implement that in Fedora and make it a better place for mentors and mentors. With that, thank you very much. And I will... And I outside would, is yes. happening the group photo, exactly. so we need to okay. run. Yeah. <laughs>